As IFRS 17 moves from the standard setting to the implementation stage, a new chapter has opened, bringing with it fresh uncertainties. I'm Richard Banks with AMBEST TV. Joining me to discuss some of the disclosure requirements of the new standard is Tony Silverman, Director at AMBEST. Tony, thanks for joining us. Let's jump right in and talk about the Contractual Service Margin, or CSM. It's a vital part of IFRS 17 for life insurers. The standard requires quite granular record keeping of the CSM by so-called groups in order to identify loss-making policies. There's been quite a lot of coverage of that, but the standard is much less demanding on the actual minimum disclosure. How do you envisage CSM disclosure to users of the reporting will work? Well, this is uh, it's principally a life insurance question, this one, and uh, thanks for the question, Richard. We'll certainly see the, the roll forward with the estimated uh, CSM uh, from business written in the year, various changes on the enforce and the amount amortized uh, into profit to leave a new balance at the end of the year. Uh, that much is uh, certainly required by the standard. But the interesting aspect is to think about what we will see if you consider there are, there are two different numbers in the reporting. Uh, one is the balance of the CSM in the balance sheet, and the other is the amortization of that CSM into profit in the reporting period. And it's the composition of that CSM amortization into profit and loss, where IFRS 17 all being well can tell us something new. And I'm envisaging that it uh, could work very well in this aspect. Indeed, it's, uh, it's a large part of the point of IFRS 17 that it should tell us something new uh, on this uh, component of the profit figure. Uh, and the question is, is the new business, the CSM, uh, from the new business written in the year, which we'll see in the roll forward anyway, the question to ask is, is that ever delivered? And the question of whether new business profit has actually estimated new business profit has been subsequently been delivered has never really been clear from the reported numbers uh, in, um, in accounting frameworks in the past. And the way that this becomes uh, clear to users is if the CSM composition, if we're told what came from three years ago, what came from four years ago, what came from the business written five years ago, those so-called annual cohorts. And that tells us if the estimated new business profit as a, a CSM has been delivered. Uh, and those annual cohorts are at least as important for participating business. And uh, I, I'd just like to add here, it would be very disappointing uh, for users of the reporting if the EU uh, adopts IFRS 17 with an optional carve out for uh, annual cohorts for a large part of uh, European participating business. That's still a possibility. We hope it doesn't happen. Uh, one thing I would say is that there's uh, quite a closely dotted line, if you will, that can be drawn between annual cohort profitability and the contribution to the bonus pool for participating business. And I think it's that aspect rather than anything to do with the actual accounting that might inhibit, uh, w w which has made some, some people promote the idea that they don't want to report annual cohorts. Uh, and I'd like to just end on this question by saying that, uh, you know, where we end up is that a narrative around where the CSM is coming from, the amortization of the CSM, the profit, uh, where it's coming from in terms of product, geography, and very importantly, when the business was written, uh, will be something that should really, I think, uh, enrich the story that life insurers tell about their business. Let's move on to think about the risk adjustment. Again, that has to be allocated to each group to identify loss makers, but the disclosure requirements are even less demanding than they are for CSM. What can you tell us about how you see disclosure on the risk adjustment working under IFRS 17? Well, again, it, it is such an important question. Uh, the, the, the risk adjustment has to be allocated to groups in exactly the same way as the CSM. Indeed, that just has to be because the CSM is the profit uh, after the risk adjustment. So the uh, risk adjustment has to be there in all the same groups and at all the same time. So the disclosure could be the same. 
Uh, and the CSM and the risk adjustment are obviously equally, they're both estimates uh, at a point in time. But the disclosure could be the same. I, I think it's unlikely to be. <laughs> That's why I'm putting it this way. It's unlikely to be uh, at the beginning of the uh, of IFS 17's implementation anyway. Uh, and I'm aware of the view that the risk adjustment uh, is, is obviously heavily affected by diversification effects. Uh, the more diversified you are, the less risk adjustment per policy, if you like. Uh, and uh, and, and that it can in one sense best be calculated over large portions of the book and that's why I think there's a reluctance to disclose uh, an allocation at a more granular level. Uh, but ultimately if one just casts one's eyes to the horizon a little it's just fine actually that the accounting amount or cost at a granular level uh, happens in this case uh, quite closely uh, to depend uh, and be very closely tied to, the, if you like, the broader company and the broader insurer, uh, the shape of the insurer, the broader infrastructure at group level. And it's even fine that if that uh, mix, that infrastructure of the group changes, then that would affect the risk adjustment at a more granular level. That's uh, the whole process is really no different to overheads in any other sector of economic activity. Uh, pricing and financial reporting to external stakeholders and tracking of performance, though, uh, should still, just as with uh, as elsewhere, if you like, should still use that uh, a more granular allocation. Um, so, and I think that will happen over time, and I'll tell you one big reason why. Because, and I'd like to uh, sort of make this point that the sum of the two, the sum of the CSM and the risk adjustment is a considerably harder number than, than either of the two separately and actually rather a, a harder number than a lot of numbers in uh, insurance, particularly in the IFS 17 space. Because the sum of the two is just the uh, allocated over the policy is just the premiums less uh, simple best estimate of claims. So really quite a hard number. So we, 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 and we may add the two together in a sense we already do for some uses. There's a comparable process when we use solvency two uh, metrics. So we may add the two together and we'd like to see the same disclosure for both, uh, if you like, so that we can. Uh, and we will be able to do at a higher level, but not at a, a more granular level. The uncertainties in the two, for the two, in other words, to a large degree, they just offset each other. Uh, and I think over time, disclosure will recognize this. Though, as I say, that's uh, not where we'll be at the beginning, and it's certainly, I don't think, where we are in preparations at the moment. But I'd venture that's where we'll go. Uh, and those that want to get ahead, I think, will be uh, heading in that direction. Excellent. Thanks, Tony. Finally, let's talk about return on equity. How do you think the way insurers communicate return on equity under the new standard will work? Will we continue to have a variety of these measures? I think initially we will, uh, but uh, they, they won't all be doing the same thing. And I think ultimately they won't all have the same importance. Uh, and we do discuss ROEs at some length in the note, as uh, obviously we do the other subjects such as the CSM. Uh, I, I would say I think this is... Uh, a very important and actually to a degree neglected aspect of how IFS 17 is going to work uh, when the time comes. Because in, in simple terms, uh, the more level profit profile that we'll see under IFS 17, more level than in any existing uh, format for most business, uh, that will create a far closer link uh, between accounting ROEs and the achieved return over the policy life of business on a life insurer's books. Uh, and, and that's just a, a if that's where we go in, I think it, it is how it will work, uh, that would be normal. That would be the normal accounting outcome that ROEs represent an economic measure of the return achieved. What's unsatisfactory is that at the moment, uh, that relationship between ROEs and, if you like, the internal rate of return that insurers are achieving on their products, that relationship is pretty much broken. Uh, again, principally for life insurers, because at the moment the ROE depends on accounting rather than the product 
Uh, it, it's low for so-called value reporting, uh, things like solvency two or the old embedded value reporting, tends to be high with uh, under IFS four, uh, where profits are delayed, uh, or that's often the case. It's not always the case. It can vary, but basically it's all over the place. And what, what should eventually change uh, when ROEs start to mean something about the return that's being achieved uh, is that discussion of ROEs becomes a discussion of where profitability lies in a real sense across the business. And you'll end up with a more conventional conversation with financial stakeholders, more transparency, uh, and that should en uh, enhance the insurer's story with the uh, wider financial community. It will no longer be seen as such a black box. There would no longer be such a requirement for stability or dividends to offset uh, a transparency deficit. So it should encourage innovation in that way. Uh, and in general terms, it should be good for the sector. I should say we won't be there straight away. This is the question of uh, the transition on the back book and the influence that that has, but it could be pulled out. Uh, and again, uh, uh, insurers will, um, I think, very much help themselves and promote, promote all this if they develop a narrative around what their ROE is. Tony, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you, Richard. For more details on IFRS 17 and to view Tony's latest report, visit ambest.com. For AMBest TV, I'm Richard Banks.